Welcome to Wake Up with Patty Catter. Come dive into today's episode sponsored by the Patriotic Mermaid. Hello, everybody. You're listening to Wake Up with Patty Catter, and I am your host, Patty Catter. Thank you all for joining us. I am super stoked about today's show because PJ always makes me laugh. I just absolutely <laughs> love him. Um, for those of you who don't know, PJ is an amazing actor. He is an amazing comedian, and I don't think you're going to go very far listening into the show without laughing some for some reason. I don't know if it'll be at me or <laughs> because of his jokes, <laughs> but PJ, thank you so much for joining us. Oh, I'm so excited. I, and, and honestly, thank you so much for asking me to be on. And you're blowing up. I've paid attention. You're killing it. So thank congratulations you. to yourself. And uh, amazing actor. I will, uh, it might be a stretch. <laughs> my, if you go on to IMDB, you'll see that uh, I started Larry Cable Guy's Delta Farce. I know, I saw that. I know, I know. I can give you some money back. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's, it, currently, I think it sits at... Uh, at 3% on Rotten Tomatoes, and uh, Howard the Duck is at 13. So it's not the greatest, not the greatest movie of all time, but uh, it was going to be in one. I yeah. think anybody in the military or affiliated with the military has seen it, though. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, that was a big, big, big thing, but uh, mm -hmm. it, it was pretty, it was pretty fun to be on that, and then, uh, yeah, and we met, because when we did, uh, I did Tee It Up for Troops, and we, uh, I got to entertain all the troops down there, so yeah, I mean, you pretty much tricked me because I thought you were George Bush. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah. Somebody's like, George Bush is here. And I was like, are you serious? And come to find out there was like an impersonator, but I thought you were George Bush. And here's a secret. I used to have a crush on George W. Bush. Don't ask me why. I oh, know. wow. That's funny. And then you saw me. You're like, oh, boy, that's not him at all. No, I was just <laughs> like, that is not not him i was yeah. tricked <laughs> when did when did george bush uh start to look like the liquid guy from the terminator 2 when did that happen oh come on <laughs> like, hey that guy's cool too i met him patrick something robert patrick yeah yeah yeah, yeah. i met him yeah <laughs> yeah when i was in the, when i was in the military everyone used to call they'd be like yo here comes a t-1000 because that's what he was called oh so, yeah now i see the resemblance but you're a little yeah. bit better looking Shh. <laughs> Thanks. I'll take, I'll take. I'll take. All right. So I would love it if you could tell our listeners just a little bit about yourself and your childhood, kind of where you grew up, kind of fill us in. Where, where did you come from, PJ? Sure. Uh, I came from, uh, a, well, I was born in New York City. I was born in New York City, and then uh, I was raised in a town 60 miles north of New York City called Brewster. And Brewster is uh, kind of famous for just like three, three things. Um, Marlo Thomas who's Danny Thomas's hmm. daughter, Danny Thomas, who started uh, St. Jude's, who did St. Jude's, that big thing. He was a big comedian. Marlo Thomas had a television show called That Girl, and her character moved down from the little town called Brewster to the city. So that was like the big thing. And then it was Laura Branigan who saw, sang Gloria, uh, if you remember that song, uh, Gloria. She came from Brewster. And then Ava Fabian, Miss August, 1986. And then... Uh -huh. There's PJ Walsh, Star Search Loser, 2003. So that's pretty much that's oh, pretty much the on. pedigree. Well, you that's were on Ninja Warrior, though. I was on American Ninja Warrior. Yeah, I've done my I've done my share, my share of things. Yeah, you but, you've um, done some things. Um, for those of you who are listening, I know you want to know what PJ's done. So PJ, kind of give us a rundown. Uh, I, well, yeah, I've done American Ninja Warrior uh, a couple times, and then. Uh, you know, I've done a lot of things. I, I used to tour with all the blue collar guys. So I, uh, a lot of their their stuff you'd hear me on or see me on and on their DVDs in the back end. And then uh, I left stand up uh, for a couple years and went to theater school in New York City um, and created a one man show called Over There Comedy is the Best Weapon, which was about my military experience and my experience overseas entertaining troops. Uh, I've been entertaining troops overseas. I, my first trip, I think, to entertain troops overseas was 2002 and then uh you know a few trips into iraq and numerous trips into afghanistan and then all over and i did that for a lot of years and then culminated pretty much into like 2007 i ended up in a c-130 full of flag draped coffins and and uh for about five hours carrying uh, remains and that just kind of became a fork in the road in my career 
because I was pretty much like a comedian who just had his head down, who was just trying to do everything I do comedically. And then I just I came back. I didn't feel the same about uh, what I was doing. And I knew I had a voice. I knew that I could make people laugh. I knew that I could use my words to make people laugh. But I also felt like, okay, let's see if I could use these words to make them feel. If they can, if I can tell my story and give some empathy to whoever was underneath those colors, colors those flags. And that moment, actually, which really impacted me the most was that we participated in a removal ceremony and I had to stand at parade, parade rest and watch them and then snap at attention. And I hadn't done that since I was 18 years old. Mm -hmm. And that just kind of made me go, God, you know, I got to do something with this craft that I have um, because I want to be able to tell the story of whoever's in there. Because that's me in there, you know, mm -hmm. like I, I'm no better than anybody. And why do I get to do all these cool things? Like I got to play Radio City Music Hall and be in a movie and all these cool things. So I wanted to show that each number is, is, is a personal story and a personal life. And so I left for a couple of years and created the one man show and it ended up uh, winning some awards at French festivals and things like that. And I, I, that ran its course cause it's kind of tough at the end. I don't like to visit the, um, the darkness uh, on a numerous, although it was very, very funny, but it's a, a gut punch at the end. And so I did that and then uh, I got back into stand up like crazy. And then I did Ninja Warrior out of that. Most of the things I do is always kind of military, kind of affiliated in a way I just work better when like I ran a marathon I do uh, adventure sports I, I work better when it's not about me even though I'm a stand-up mm -hmm. um, and it's like my story I always feel better when it's something that's other than myself mm -hmm. and uh, even when I created the one-man show about myself I kind of was like if I tell the story it's got to represent more than me and so that was kind of uh, that's kind of how been my functioning goal. And I also listen to my friends. Mm -hmm. They always give me that thing where they're like, um, you're so much more excited when you come back from like teed up for troops or 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 you do an adventure race with uh, adaptive athletes or you, you, or you run a marathon like you, you're so much more. And I noticed that. And uh, so that's, you know, that's it. And it might come from depreciation from the from for, for this country. I think that you know, going back to where I'm from, both my parents immigrated from Ireland. So I'm, I'm uh, a product of immigrants that came to this country. So, and when they came here, I mean, they didn't know anybody. And then they both met here and, and, you know, they worked incredibly hard. They had nothing. My father was a plumbing contractor and he built everything that provided for us from the ground up mm -hmm. and just a real appreciation for the country. And that's when, why I ended up serving because I, I felt like I needed to give time back to our country if I was gonna you know try to do the best I can in it so and then I still feel the same now that I'm older and I look back and I see these men and women in uniform you know I, I just think it's something you just do you know you you just go back and you help and you do everything you can uh, within your own you know I have this little talent that I can make people laugh so if I can use that to help raise funds for for um, any causes that are going to help the people that are in my lane of service, then I'm totally going to do that. So when you were growing up, did you plan on joining the military or what made you decide to join the Navy? Oh man. So that's so crazy. Cause I didn't, I really didn't because I was ever, the most I knew about the military was a lot of my friends, fathers were in Vietnam and it was just very harrowing, you know, like the results and all the stories and everything that, that, that you would hear. So as a kid, I really didn't. But then when it came time for me to leave and leave high school, like I was a mess. Like I was a dyslexic. Uh, was I'm still dyslexic. not like it went away. But um, I was diagnosed with this. Actually, when I was in third grade, I, was, I did a test and I was diagnosed with dyslexia. And I actually, I was in Catholic school. And I wrote from the bottom of the page up and from uh, right to left. So, and technically that's Hebrew. So they kicked me out of Catholic school. <laughs> <laughs> they were like, no, no, we can't have them here. So, but during that time period, there wasn't, there wasn't any like classes. Nobody knew anything. I clearly had ADD. I was eating sugar like crazy. Like when I look back and I look at what, what was going on, like, of course I was bouncing <laughs> off the walls, you know? So I would just sit in class and stare out the window and couldn't wait uh, to get out of there. And so when it came time for me to graduate, I knew I wasn't going to do well in college. I knew that wasn't going to do well. And 
I was like, well, maybe I'll join a serve. I'll, maybe I'll join a serve. I just want to get out of my hometown. I wanted to, I wanted my life to be a Springsteen song, you know, mm-hmm. like I love Bruce Springsteen. I was like, God, I want my life to be a Bruce Springsteen song. And when I look at my life, I'm like, actually, it's more it's interesting of- than, but, you know, it's, 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 it's turned out kind of oddly. My friends call me like a, a Forrest Gump because it turns out very odd. Um, so I was thinking at the service and the reason I joined the Navy, oddly enough, is because of Luke Duke from the Dukes of Hazard. Oh, this is God's truth. This is exactly this is this is how simple minded I was. So Luke Duke, uh, who, who Tom Wolpat played the mm-hmm. character. So his character was a former Navy boxing champ. <laughs> and I thought that was the coolest thing. So I actually joined the Navy. So my biggest decision in my life was based off a TV character's backstory. It wasn't even like an actual episode. Like some, <laughs> some guy in Hollywood wrote like, oh, let's make him a former a boxer in the Navy. That won't influence a kid's entire existence. <laughs> and, throw it out there. And, and that's kind of what uh, gravitated me towards the Navy. And then the day after I graduated high school, I remember being at, a, at the graduation party and I, I was sitting on a hill and there was some girl came up and she was crying because we we had hooked up like six months prior but we never saw each other and she was crying and then this these all, this car comes up it's all in slow motion they're like this car comes up doors open and all this weed smoke comes out and all these like stoner guys come out and some girls thrown <laughs> up and someone's holding their hair back and i'm watching all this going and i remember just going i'm getting out of here <laughs> I'm getting out. So I called the recruiter the next day and they offered me two jobs. I could, I want, I said, I want to leave today. And uh, the two jobs were a hole technician and a dental technician. And I said, well, what's a hole technician? And they said, well, that's a plumber. And I said, well, my grandfather's a plumber. My uncle's a plumber. My dad's a plumber. I've been a plumber my whole life. I'm going to go with the teeth. I'm changing direction. So um, I ended up going to the dental technology school and then I ended up going to field medical service school and I ended up at uh, Camp Majun with the Marines. And then I went, I spent six months in the Gulf on USS Nashville, attached to the Marines, kind of like the cleanup unit, the um, oh, wow. Gulf War. Uh, I mean, I'm, I guess on paper it was still going on, but like, uh, mm-hmm. but everybody was going home and we were kind of out there in case something happened. And uh, yeah, and then, and then after that, I, I got I transferred to Bethesda Naval Hospital because I wanted to start doing comedy. And I knew that, uh, oddly enough, a, a, com- a guy who was stationed with me, Tony Woods, who if you watched... Um, Dave Chappelle, who Dave Chappelle got yeah. the Kennedy Awards, he said, Tony Woods is my hero. He's who I wanted to be. Well, Tony and I were stationed together, and I knew Tony lived in D.C., and he was doing comedy up there. I knew all these great comics came from D.C., so I picked wow. Bethesda to be close to that city. So mm-hmm. oddly enough, he influenced me, and um, I got there, and then eventually one day stepped on stage, but then I ended up working in the White House, too. I ended up taking care of all the dental in the White House um, and Camp David. So it was wow. pretty, it was a pretty wild time to, uh, at the time. So starting comedy, cleaning the president's teeth. Uh, so really which wild. president was that? Um, Clinton. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I like, you know, when I'm on stage, I, I tell the joke because I don't like, I like it a lot. I like to try, have the audience guess and mm-hmm. I'll be like, I'll, I'll tell the story a little bit and to get them kind of like hooked in, like wonder which president, like you didn't, and I'll be like, and I'll go, oh, let me see if you figure it out. And I'll tell them, I'll go, uh, I was in charge of the presidency mouth who hands down has the most famous oral history like, oh. they pretty much narrow it down pretty easy once i give them the hint you know yeah so. my mind was in the gutter as soon as you said his name i was like oh it's it's really interesting because when i tell the stories of my stories and i tell the story of the white house and when i tell it on stage and, and one of the reasons i also created the one man show was i used to try to talk about how i worked on a white worked in the white house because a lot of comedians like big comedians were like you got to talk about that mm-hmm. my face didn't match the story like people were like well you're too young there's no way you could have like been in charge of any kind of health care in the white house or any, any or anything like that. and i eventually create one of the reasons i created one man show was in the middle of that i wanted to show that like i was a dyslexic kid who had nowhere to go and I end up getting to the White House. Mm-hmm. And when I, when I used to work in the White House, one thing I used to do is, you know, I would walk out. And this is before Oklahoma City bombing. And what happened after, after Oklahoma City bombing is, like, before, you could just walk. Like, it was, like, crazy down there. It was like a college campus. Like, working in the White House before Oklahoma City. Because Oklahoma City was kind of the prior to – it was, like, the almost – 
you started etching towards what happened after 9-11, like security wise, but mm -hmm. it was very lax before then. And you just walk around and then once that happened, you had to have the clearance, you had to have the Yankee white clearance, you had to do all this to get in. So I would, and then they, they closed off Pennsylvania Avenue and it was all blocked off. But after I'd finished leaving the White House, I'd go sit in the park and I'd look at all the people looking in the gate and taking pictures and wow. doing all that. And I would sit there and I would collectively in my mind go, if you showed me a picture of the White House and the moon when I was in high school, they were the same distance away from me. Mm -hmm. I wasn't getting to either of those. Mm -hmm. And I'd be like, but I'm, I'm, I work in the White House. I can walk right in there. You know, I can go down to the dental clinic. I, you know, I, I clean the president's teeth. I get, I'm like, wow, well, I wonder what else I can do. So it implanted this crazy, like, wow, anything's possible thing. And that's kind of what drove me to be a comedian. And I was like, mm -hmm. well, I'm sure. I, I mean, if I got to the White House, I'm sure I could <laughs> tell jokes, make people laugh, you know? So. Well, and you're really good. So the, the first time I met you, I don't even remember what year it was. It was at a Tee It Up for Troops event. And honestly, that was the first time in a long time I had really laughed. Oh, that's um, great. My life had been pretty crazy stressful. Um, just a lot of stuff going on. And the time before, before I met you, the only person who really made me laugh like that was Henry Winkler. Oh, funny. The Fonz. Who the, yeah. the Fonz is the greatest. Yeah. So, I mean, that's a pretty big compliment. Um, I'll take it. I love laughing and I love jokes, but not that many comedians can actually just crack me up. Um, I have a really weird sense of humor in the first place, but um, you're just really good in the way you connected with the audience. And the thing is, when you guys, when PJ goes to these events with the military, you can tell that you care, PJ. Um, mm. And that makes all the difference, I think, um, too, because, you know, some, some comedians, they'll get up on stage and they're complete assholes. <laughs> yeah. And um, you floored me, first of all, you, you completely shocked me. <laughs> your, <laughs> your language up there was just like, oh my word, <laughs> this guy is like, like every other word cussing. <laughs> well, it, depend, it really is funny because I can work completely clean. Mm -hmm. And then also, but when I'm with the military, they want, you know, it's, you're with the military. So it's almost, it's, it's, it's a different lane. And I think there are certain entertain, there's certain entertainers when you get around people who speak your same language. Mm -hmm. So I have a lot of friends who are Christian comedians. You put them in the church and uh, they're speaking their language. Now I can go into a church and I can work clean and make them laugh, mm -hmm. but I don't know if I'd be speaking their language because I'm not a regular church goer, you know? Mm -hmm. So, it, so, but when I'm with the military, it's like, oh, I've been here. I've, I know this. I know this language. I'm on this wavelength. Mm -hmm. So when I'm in that room, it's um, and it's also where I started. They're kind of who, when I was in the military, they're who pushed me to become a comedian. So it's almost in a way of going home. So I also like, I also kind of try to mix it up, whatever. I don't always want to feel safe, but I also can work for an hour and a half crystal clean too. So I think <laughs> I like having those different gears. Well, I think sure. that you totally grabbed my attention because I, first of all, I was not expecting it. And at the time, my, my mind thought frame, whatever. Um, when did George was, Bush get so <laughs> vulgar? <laughs> I know. And, um, <laughs> and I was thinking, you know, this guy is up there and he doesn't care what anybody thinks, apparently. Like he's just going off. And I needed that in my life at that time because I was always super self-conscious of what people were thinking of me or what I thought people thought of me. Mm. And I was raised in a super conservative home. And so for me, I needed that little jolt <laughs> and you definitely gave it to me. Um, but you also like, you know, like PJ said, his, his jokes were also, he had a lot of clean ones as, as well. So this yeah. his whole show, I don't want you all to think like his whole show was just vulgar. Well, and the thing about it is, is and, and a lot of times with the militaries, they want to be messed with. So mm -hmm. when you're messing with them, you know, it kind of, it, it, it does get a bit more, uh, more rough. I, I mean, I, I, and I like, I like material. Mm -hmm. But I, I also don't mind like the improv and going back and forth with, with people too. So whatever, it, whatever it calls for, mm -hmm. it just depends. There's always different things. And then as far as making you laugh, what's an interesting thing about comedy is no one ever looks at it in a way. Comedy is no different than music or movies or TV. And there are, people have certain flavors that they like, but for some reason, everyone thinks comedy is just one big thing. But 
you know, people like Westerns, people like mm -hmm. comedies, people like drama. Some people don't like Westerns, some people don't like horror. And comedy works out the same way. There are people who are like, I love Jerry Seinfeld. And people are like, I don't like Jerry Seinfeld. Some people love Kevin Hart. Some people love like, uh, you know, Kathleen Mag is one of my favorite comedians of all time. And, and you know, I've tried to play her for somebody. And they're like, oh, I'm not feeling them. I'm like, well, you're crazy. I think she's amazing. So I, comedy is, it, oddly enough, is everyone thinks, well, oh, I'm supposed to, you're just supposed to make me laugh. But it does fall into like what your preference is in, in a way. So I'm happy that I, that I got you that day. <laughs> you did. And I'm wondering, did you ever go to comedy school? You said that you went to theater school, right? For a couple yes, of years. Yes, I went to theater school. No, I didn't go to comedy school. No. So uh -huh. last year. Oh wait, year you know what? Mm -hmm. I, I think I did take a class in New York. Huh. I think there was like a, cl a class and I went there and just to meet other comedians. I'm not against mm -hmm. like comedy schools. I think like some people think, I think you should, it, they, cause I'm actually, Arm Service Art Partnerships, a nonprofit that I do a lot of work with. And um, I'm an artistic, uh, I don't know what my title is now. I'm sorry, <laughs> I've been there since the beginning. But um, uh, they they create a program, a comedy boot camp, where veterans get to come in and they get to like work for six six weeks and then they go do a show. And it's very, very helpful. I th especially, I, I think, and I think you know this, it's much like Tee Up to Troops, Tee It Up for Troops, Arm Service Art Partnership, World Team Sports, these, these great nonprofits that they create a community where, mm -hmm. where veterans can go. And when veterans are comfortable with other veterans, like that's what a healing happens. Mm -hmm. So in, out of that boot camp, these, there, there's whole instruction. So I think for, they give you all the basics. And then, so you should take a class and then move on because it is school of hard knocks. So mm -hmm. you can get the class so they can teach you the basics, but then you got to get out there and start hitting the clubs. So. Yeah. I took a comedy class last year. Oh, yeah, it, it was really fun, but I discovered that being up on stage in the comedy club where I was at was completely different than I pictured it. So I've been a public speaker and I usually have all the lights on so you can see the people in the audience. This comedy club, it was pitch dark and all you could see was a bright light at the end of the tunnel. So it was, it was a little nerve wracking to me. <laughs> That's so but. funny you say that because my very first time on stage was Headliners Comedy Club on in Bethesda, Maryland, Wisconsin Avenue. Mm -hmm. And I walked up on stage and you can smoke in the clubs back then. This is how I'm dating myself. <laughs> and I walk up and my first time on stage and the mic was up there in the mic stand and the light was so bright. All you saw was the mic stand mm -hmm. and the light and all the smoke was going up behind oh. it. And I remember <laughs> clicking my head back, looking at it and going, this is so cool, man. <laughs> like I just like fell in love right away. I don't know, like that imagery. Mm -hmm. I was just like, this is like the coolest thing I ever seen. <laughs> and all I was thinking is walk into the light because you're gonna die right now. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I, I, look! I said, look! I said this is so cool, and then died a little bit after. No problem. Like it wasn't like it, it didn't take right away, but it was very. Um, it was. I the image was. I'll, it'll stay with me forever. It's <laughs> awesome. Um, where can people go to visit your social media? Um, right now because so, of covid like i don't know if you have any events coming up but oh i'm everything everything's gone and mm -hmm. i kind of powered down uh i'm i'm a i'm very odd when it comes to social media my friends are just like my buddy uh matt eisman who's a host of ninja warrior he said it, he goes you're like the first one to kind of walk away from social media and is happy and i don't really know where i'm at i've been using this time period to kind of figure out how i want to go about things so i i i, I think this is this this time's very what you can do for it. So I want to I want to come out of this a better human being. So mm -hmm. I'm trying to do the best I can on that. And for the past couple of years, I've been struggling with social media in a way of like, why am I doing it? Mm -hmm. Like, am I posting this picture to pat myself on the back? Am I, uh, you know, contributing to this? And I quit drinking years ago. And one of the reasons is like I, I didn't like the way it made me feel or who I was or what I was like conducting myself and I started to feel that way social media wise mm -hmm. and um so I had to take a step back and I took like six months off and what I'd realized was um I read just as much during the day but I replaced unhealthy words with healthy words mm -hmm. if that makes sense and I just was overall just happy and I had this moment that happened to me at a comedy club and I keep going back on it. Now, I don't have the answer because I, I, clearly you could be very successful in social media. This is just me personally. Mm -hmm. But I was, in, I was up at a comic club and I was in a green room and my wife comes up to me and she says, hey, do you, guy, you know a guy, a guy named um, Kenny Brooks? 
uh, he says he's from Brewster and he's here. I'm like, mm-hmm. and she, she said, I freaked out. She, I was like, Kenny Brooks is here. Kenny Brooks is in this building right now. And she was like, yeah, she goes, she wants to come up and see you. I'm like, you better get him up here. Well, he joined a Navy. We were on a wrestling team together. He joined a Navy a year before me. We were in high school. And then we, we haven't, I hadn't seen him since 1994. And he was one of my best friends in high school. Well, he's in the military and he's not on social media or any of that stuff. He just showed up. Mm-hmm. And my wife said, I never seen you that excited. She mm-hmm. goes, I never seen you that excited. And it hit me that, wow, how much joy is social media taking from me? Just pure mm-hmm. joy. Because mm-hmm. had he sent me a message like on Instagram or something like, hey, I'm going to come by the show, I would have been primed for that event. That's you true. Know? Yeah. Yeah. But seeing him and the hug and the and just the joy and how happy we were to see each other, I kind of it kind of it was another layer of me standing back going, what am I what am what kind of moments am I taking away from myself mm-hmm. by trying to be overly informed or overly connected? So I've been kind of debating on that. But with that said, I'll always have PJWalsh.com. You can get to PJWalsh.com and you can find everything. But um, mm-hmm. I'm on a weird journey with seeing where I'm going to go with that. I have Facebook and I have Instagram, which is PJ Walsh Live. And I don't do Twitter. I just mm-hmm. never, I never was. Me yeah, I was never a fan. I, I always felt surface and always felt kind of you were throwing digs and, and, mm-hmm. and kind of like a vicious thing. I, I just don't, I don't know why Twitter to me is, <laughs> I always tell my friend, I'm like, I don't know why you're still doing it. It's the bar at three o'clock in the morning. Nothing happens <laughs> good at three o'clock, in the, but it's three o'clock in the morning all the time, mm-hmm. you know? Uh, but I do, I, I do enjoy Instagram, but I, I, I at this point, I'm a just, I have a, a allotment of my energy and time. So I'm really just trying to discover where I, where I want to go with that. So. I love that. I actually took a step back and um, promised myself, a while back that I would just post positive, encouraging notes, especially right now because of COVID. Um, So that's all I'm doing. I unfollowed a lot of like negativity. There's a lot of that out there and I don't need that anymore, you know? (laughs) So I mean, obviously, yeah, there's just so much that I I learned. Here's another lesson on that because I find this very interesting and I want to see if you. Mm -hmm. So what I had also realized at a certain point was, I remember I was in Fargo. I was up in, in Fargo. I was doing a show for these like military bikers, all these big biker guys, uh, military veteran bikers invited me into their like private like show thing. And mm-hmm. I'm in a Panera Bread and I'm working on my computer because I can get free Wi-Fi. And I look out the window and there was a woman and she she was eating an ice cream cone. She had yoga pants on and she was smoking a cigarette. <laughs> <laughs> so she's like <laughs> taking a drag <laughs> right and i see this so i go on facebook and i post uh something that said like uh yoga pants ice cream cone cigarette J- just witnessed that amazing trifecta right and and also people are commenting this this that and you know is that your girlfriend it's like <laughs> people give me a hard time and going back and forth just laughing and then like the 26th comment a woman writes um well, I, I guess wearing yoga pants makes you fat and disgusting. Oh someone's my goodness. comedy, someone's comedy just stopped being funny. And oh. I'm looking at this and I go, well, I didn't say anything about, cause I really try to make a choice. Like comedy has a target. I usually try mm-hmm. to make myself the target. I don't want to make anyone feel bad. That's not mm-hmm. why I get up in the morning. I get, get up to make people laugh. Mm-hmm. And I was like, Oh, so I have this struggle with myself going, do I want to correct her? Do I want to get back this back and forth? Like you're, you're pro- projecting whatever you got, whatever. So mm-hmm. I hover over a picture and she's overweight and I'm like, okay. <laughs> so somehow she took this personally. So I decided I'm not saying anything. Mm-hmm. And then about two weeks later, she puts a post up and a post was, uh, I remember it specifically. It said, I'm very proud of my two children and how they conducted themselves since the sudden loss of my husband. Oh, wow. So her husband had passed away Mm -hmm. and then it hit me. I was like, Oh, she just needed to take it out on somebody. Mm -hmm. And part of my job, part of a public figure's job is you have to, you have to shoulder other people's pain. Mm -hmm. So sometimes they'll come at you. And Mm -hmm. it just hit me going, had I engaged her, I would have made it so much worse for whatever she was going through. So that day hit me where I was just like, and I started doing exactly what you're doing. My wife is great at it. Anything that I post goes through her. Uh, mm-hmm. I just don't go willy nilly on my own. And, mm-hmm. and she always, it's like, if I don't have anything positive to say, then I'm not going to, I'm not going to say like anything. And I'm also very specific in what I talk about because I think people talk about everything. 
Mm -hmm. Everyone has, there's so many, everyone, like I, I can't even, I go through my, if I went through my Facebook, I'm like, I didn't know I went to high school with so many political and sports <laughs> uh, experts. Like, yeah, that's un unbelievable. Like, mm -hmm. and, but I do believe in, if you have something to say about everything, then you really don't believe in something. Mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. and for me, as you know, for me, it's, it's veterans. It's, it's working with the veterans because that's what's touched me. And I try mm -hmm. to explain to people, whatever you care about, just understand not everybody cares about it on the same level you do. Mm -hmm. so exactly so you, you get around to people who do and try the best you can to move positively forward mm -hmm. and then I also try to continue to have a growth mindset and to listen so right now I've been off all of that stuff because I think it's an important time just to listen to listen mm -hmm. to learn and to and to, to come from these movements because all these movements which they all start in very informative and and, and that's where I think social media stuff stuff is great because mm -hmm. when you look at these things if I look back at the like the me too movement I'm like man I really learned a lot from that mm -hmm. you know there's a lot of things I didn't know and then sometimes obviously the pendulum swings too much and then right now we're in black lives matter I'm learning so much from like in in, in this too and it's just one of these things where I don't I mean like those these are two subjects where I'm like I isn't anywhere this is where I just need to sit back and learn Mm -hmm. and, and and hear from other people's experiences so that's you know that's where social media to me right now is like I don't know I love that I like that a lot um I think it's a good place um I think COVID has affected everybody so differently but I believe that most of my friends and most of the people that I know we're all kind of just kind just stepping back a little bit and kind of assessing like what's really important um and trying to figure that out I'm also recently met. I got married in August. My yeah, first time being married. Yeah. <laughs> so um, I feel like when it comes to COVID, I tell mm -hmm. people, I, go, I feel like uh, I was put in an episode of Big Brother and there's only two contestants, my wife and I, and I knew <laughs> out of the gate I wasn't going to win. <laughs> but the cool part is, I, I would say in the past six months, we grew as a married couple that it would have probably taken us five years yes. with how much I travel and things mm -hmm. like that. So I try to focus as much on that. So spending time with my wife and us really getting to, I mean, we're just in each other's growth 24 <laughs> seven. So really getting to, to know each other. And she's actually <laughs> like, my job's gone. People be, like, it's all, it's not coming back anytime soon, Sh but she's considered an essential worker. So she's working. So I'm going to hear about that for the rest of my life. <laughs> like our kids and all that stuff. Well, mommy was an essential worker, but um, him, Mr. Joke Boy, not so much. He wasn't, much, he wasn't really needed when, when a time came. <laughs> I remember when we were, when I was first married years ago, um, I said something to my husband, like, why do you treat complete strangers so much nicer than you treat me? Like I was upset at him. So I was kind of lashing out at him. It wasn't true, but you know. Um, but he says, well, I don't have to live with them 24 <laughs> seven. Oh, it's, it's amazing how you can say things and then just bounce right back. And mm -hmm. I, I guess the comfort I've got is like, you know, here's somebody I know is not going anywhere. And that was a hard thing for me to find for a lot of years. Just somebody mm -hmm. who, who, um, just brings a certain amount of joy and comfort and confidence to, to, to our relationship and to me as a person. So that, that was cool. And it's been pretty, that part has been great. But uh, at the end of the day, I, I mean, I would switch it. I, I, don't, I wish we didn't have 180,000 people who've lost their lives like in that, but you know, mm -hmm. that's, that's, that's the hard part. And I think it's also as a veteran and what we've done, we've seen, we've seen some hard, we've seen some hard things. We've seen some incredibly strong people. We've seen people come back from, from certain things. And, and it's also very adaptive. Being in the military gives you an adapt. You get put in these situations and you make the best of it. Mm -hmm. um, and it doesn't mean the situation's good. I do case. have one more question for you, PJ. Yeah. And you don't have to answer it. I'm putting you on the spot here. Sure. Well, well I got so, to answer it. <laughs> so um, with your spouse, mm -hmm. you know when you're at a comedy show and you just kind of start shooting out at the audience? Have you uh -huh. tried that with her? Like... <laughs> oh like going like, back and forth or like, cut her down? yeah like uh who taught you how to cook i don't know <laughs> like do you do that like does that part of your comedy act ever come out at her and how does she react <laughs> oh that's interesting um i mean if we do funny thing like if she does something silly she knows i'm, I'm gonna get her 
but she's good too. She she comes back. Like she'll <laughs> she's very good. The, the reason I love her is she just lets me be me in a way that I've that I hadn't been previously and lets me do the goofiest, silliest things to make her laugh. And like whenever I would leave, I, like we have these we collected stuffed animals and I would leave and put them all in a certain way on the bed to like uh-huh. say good day to her. So and I'd always do like these weird little creative things to kind of just know to make her smile because I'm gone. Mm-hmm. And but when but on the other end, like yeah, we get out of each other, but I don't know if I like hit her like a like a heckler. Because a heckler <laughs> is like the interesting thing about a heckler is no comedians like them. Like that's the guy's honest truth. We just want to kind of do our thing. There that's are comedians true. who just do do crowd work. But if you have mm-hmm. something to say and you you've crafted this this stu- you this these jokes or this story or I'm I'm kind of a storyteller and mm-hmm. you've crafted it, you want to share it. So it almost always becomes like a skip in a record, you know. And you're like, uh. But the thing about a heckler is, what's funny about them, oddly enough, the formula is they only have like one thing in their ch- chamber most of the time. So they'll say something. And then what you do is you kind of, I think the martial art Aikido is like, you kind of let it in and use the person's energy against them. And so they can, they'll say something and I always hit them with kindness and kind of include them. Mm-hmm. And then they'll, tr- if they, what happens is now the, the attention's on them mm-hmm. and you can actually see them get flushed. You can see their eyes dilate. You're like, Oh wait, we're going further than this. Mm-hmm. And by that time, I'm loading so much in my mental <laughs> chamber because this is what I do. Mm-hmm. And then uh, you kind of let, you kind of let them play their game until you hear somebody in the audience say, Oh man, I wish this, I wish they just shut up and leave. And once you hear that, mm-hmm. that's when you can take them out. <laughs> Cause now you have the audience on your side. And then that's when I say, I pull out the Wolverine claws and I got to take them out. And then by the end, they're no, 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 no. Goodbye. They're screaming goodbye to the person. But if you go out, if you take them out prior to that, you look insecure so it's kind of like a a thing so uh, but i'll never do that i don't wolverine crawl as my wife there, no wait i yeah, gotta, I, I, gotta don't go think, <laughs> I don't think that would go too good <laughs> no but she's uh, very funny so. mm-hmm. uh well pj thank you so much for being on the show today i'm so excited thank to have you. you and again your website is located at pjwalsh.com Awesome. com, and then we just uh, started a podcast now too ourselves oh. me and Sam Pressler who uh, created the Armed Services Art Partnership during during the quarantine Sam called me up and um, he was like yeah I'm thinking about doing a podcast and, and we've called in stitches and it's we explore the humanity and humor and we've we interview uh, just people who've kind of had moments in their life and then switched around and look at the comedy at during the hard stuff and then and come on out so there have been some very very cool conversations and we just did our first season we just did eight episodes because we're kind of less is more we're odd we're we're very odd sam and i are two interviewers who don't this is the most i've talked about myself in probably eight months like we both don't want to hear about our lives anymore we like listening to people so well i think you're really interesting and i want to check out your podcast i'm gonna subscribe to it so how can people yeah how can people subscribe to your podcast uh, just in stitches, uh, podcast. So, and if you go to my yes, website, okay. yeah, yeah. Cause it's cause stitches, mm-hmm. they, 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 cut, they heal and like the cut, you know, they work both ways. So that's mm-hmm. kind of where we came from that. But, um, yeah. And at pjwalsh.com, you can get, you got there from there, but I'm super excited about it. You're, you're doing awesome stuff. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And it's well, great to see you. It's is, it is so good to see you. You look the same. So that's good. Cause it's been a few years. <laughs> I know. And when you're married, you think I'd have fallen apart, but we worked yeah. out all right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, thank you again, PJ, for being on the show. And thank you, everybody, for listening. It has been amazing to have you on. And um, I just appreciate you. And I want to encourage you just to keep going because you did make a great difference in my life at a really pivotal time. Oh, okay. So thank you for that. And- oh, I won't stop. I'm just, I'm just, uh, <laughs> I like you, you had said, you have to take a look at things every once in a while, you know? So that's where we're at. Well, thank you. Thank you. And again, thank you everybody for listening. You can go to pattycatter.com for more podcast episodes. You can also listen on Amazon TV, Roku, and on several AM FM stations. Thank you all and have an amazing day. Thank you for listening to Wake Up with Patty Catter. Thank you. Thanks for all that you do. Sponsored by the Patriotic Mermaid. We hope you enjoyed today's episode. I love the show, guys. You're awesome. For more information and updates, check out www.pattycatter.com or thepatrioticmermaid.com. 
Also, make sure to drop us a follow on Instagram at Wake Up with Patty Catter and at The Patriotic Mermaid. Don't forget to subscribe to the show on all major podcast platforms. Until next time, take care.